example, you have universal transit passes, lessons from around the world, and uh, Karen. Thank you very much for everybody for coming and giving your time, and I'll uh, try and move uh, at a fairly decent clip through this uh, uh, so we can get on to questions and we can, uh, yeah. Um, so in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk about, uh, just to give a quick overview of the existing PATH programs that are um, in place. By the way, the title slide that's missing from this is actually the, the title of my talk, which is Universal Transit Passes. Um, I will go into a little there bit more. Oh, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> all right, so on to, so yeah, in the next 10 minutes, I'll talk about some existing PATH programs. Um, I did wanna say off the title slide too that um, this is uh, coming out of research that me and uh, one other person who couldn't make it tonight because she's working, uh, we worked together on a uh, policy, uh, transit policy discussion paper for COPE and that's sort of the context around how we ended up doing this work. Um, and it's one of actually three topics that we're exploring in that paper. So universal transit passes, um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the experience in Boulder, Colorado, where they have a really neat program called the Neighborhood EcoPass. I'll talk a little bit about the, tr I'll mention really quickly the tra uh, Transportation 2040 uh, plan update uh, that has directions on transit, and then I'll talk, um, j just sort of boil it down to three key actions that I think uh, would move this topic uh, and keep the conversation going uh, as the transit uh, topic evolves in the region and in the city as well. So existing access pass programs, uh, some of you may know some or uh, in some cases more than I do about some of these. Um, the current uh, situation, uh, most of us are probably aware about the universal transit pass that post-secondary students get at uh, the universities throughout the region uh, and in actually throughout the province in some cases. Uh, there's also a bus pass program and actually the uh, red compass card on the side there is a picture of the, that bus pass that um, is given to people who are on, I believe, disability and welfare. Uh, it has their name printed on it, and in that picture it's blurred out, um, and it's uh, made available to people for a, an administrative fee of $45 a year, and it's good for the entire transit system. Uh, then there's... Uh, Just a note, that's available for seniors of low income as well. Okay, there you go, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, uh, those are one of some of the existing programs. Um, ta uh, taxi vouchers are also made available to people who are uh, uh, using HandyDart uh, in the case that they need to make trips where um, HandyDart can't, uh, uh, just can't meet the, the, the demand. And if you talk to Eric, he can tell you so much more about HandyDart than I ever could, as well as uh, Tim here. Uh, there are other programs that we've also uh, seen discontinued recently. So there's the employee pass program, which made um, passes available uh, through uh, work places where uh, they would um, essentially handle uh, the transactions between their, the employees and TransLink so that you would go to work, you could pick up your pass for the month. Um, at the very, uh, the, it would, sorry, the price of the pass would be deducted from your payroll automatically and so you wouldn't have to go to the store and you wouldn't have to worry about it, you wouldn't have to think about it. It would require a uh, one-year commitment upfront to participate in the program. And it also made passes available to people at a slightly reduced cost. I think it's about 15% less than when you go out and buy it on your own. Um, it's discontinued uh, because of, uh, in part because of the way things are being rearranged with the compass card. Uh, we hear that there may be some kind of replacement program, but there's no been nothing announced so far. And then there was also a community pass implemented briefly at the University City development uh, up on SFU Burnaby Mountain, and it was discontinued um, primarily because it was uh, driven by grants and it wasn't financially feasible to keep it going. Next slide on. Um, so I said I had international examples of transit fare structures. I only really have two. Um, the one that's really interesting is the one that, uh, what's happening in uh, Tallinn, Estonia, which is uh, the capital city of Estonia. Um, they uh, went uh, and had a referendum on whether to offer free transit to all residents, uh, and that passed uh, in January of 2013. So they implemented it in uh, May of 2013, and what they essentially do is they mail every all uh, registered residents of the city um, a smart card that allows them to take all local transit, so not regional transit, um, all local transit service, um, unlimited for free. Uh, what's unique about Tallinn is that uh, they are a capital city, so they sort of have 
funding sources that you know a city like Vancouver might not have access to. And the other thing is that Tallinn is also trying to sort of uh, make itself into a digital city. They're really targeting like young people, and they see transit as being uh, a b very big part of uh, doing that. And uh, but it's also had a, 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 a great impact on the city with regards to reducing congestion and car use. Um, the one that I'm going to talk to you about today is the uh, neighborhood eco pass in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Boulder is a uh, small, sort of, it's confusing if you Google it online, it's actually a smaller city within the, the region uh, around Denver, Colorado, uh, not to be confused with Boulder County. Um, the program, uh, the neighborhood eco pass is um, really interesting because it's fairly long running. Uh, the program has been in place since 1997. And um, it features a large uh, amount of community engagement and involvement. Um, and I can explain exactly how that works um, in that next slide, <laughs> which is that uh, what happens when, um, when uh, with the neighborhood eco pass is that a neighborhood essentially says, we're feeling like we are, want to support transit. We, we, um, uh, a group incorporates, you know, maybe they're a local advocacy that advocacy group, they're a registered society somehow, and they approach the, um, the transit provider and they say, okay, we're interested in embarking down this path of getting a neighborhood eco pass, you know, um, and, and what that, uh, what happens is that the transit authority essentially says, okay, well, here's the cost of the transit service that's in your sort of area. And it gives them a number, literally, it give them a number and say, okay, so, um, and, and the, the idea behind the program is instead of, uh, and that number, sorry, that number it, uh, constitutes the price of the transit that uh, the people in that area are, are using. And instead of relying on the few people, or on the people who are using the pass to pay for the pass and, uh, and that constitutes their revenue, it, tr it spreads the cost of offering that service to everyone in that neighborhood. Um, and uh, what, what, what they find in, um, in Boulder is that it's, um, I think what's really appealing about it is that uh, it's a very grassroots effort. So the size of the neighborhood doesn't matter. They have no minimum limit. The eco pass, um, is sor it sort of lives next to, uh, uh, the original program is the employee eco pass. They essentially took the employee concept and they said, okay, well, why does it have to be an employer, right? It could just be a neighborhood as long as, you know, uh, you're willing to put in the time and the effort to organize yourselves in, in a way that makes sense then let's figure it out. And they'll actually go door to door and come with pledge seat sheets and say, well, this is how much we need in order to get it going for a year um, or two years or however um, the cycle it is that they, they do it on. Um, and they will talk, uh, talk to people about the benefits of it. And, um, and, and they, they, uh, the, the transit agency is a really strong partner in this and uh, I can continue. Oh, one point I wanna make too is that it is community revenue neutral. So the whole point is to take um, how much, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm getting the two minute mark, okay. Um, the point is- it's not, not my fault. Okay. Uh, the, um, so it is uh, revenue neutral. I can explain exactly what that means later. But as I said, the cost is essentially divided up. So there's no net loss to revenue on the transit agency side. For, um, and they sort of say, well, if this is how, how it breaks, what we need, how we break it down, then we'll leave you to take care of the details on how, on, on how that works, whether it's mandatory for everybody in the neighborhood or you know, if people who, there are enough people who are using transit in the neighborhood that they feel like they can foot the cost um, and uh, uh, have it work out. Um, and the initial take up is supported by subsidies from the local um, municipal sales tax. So the city of Boulder um, offsets the initial price of the pass by about 20 to 30 percent for the first year that it's implemented in the, in the neighborhood in order to encourage people to give it a try and maybe not, uh, um, you know, to commit to it long term before the full price kicks in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, how could it work here? I won't talk too much about this. There was a research uh, study done um, between, uh, it was funded by TransLink and it was uh, implemented by UBC uh, Trek program in 2004 where they actually did a pilot um, of a community pass program and what they found was that um, there was, two, uh, they did a survey, a telephone survey of a thousand people throughout the region and two thirds of them supported uh, or were interested in the idea of, um, of a, tr uh, a community pass program. Um, 65% of the people who were given the passes during the three-month pilot took transit more than a control group that they took at the same time. 
So transit use definitely went up once people had a pass that they um, had paid for. Um, one thing that's interesting is that you need to add value to the pass. That was something that they found, and I think it's also in place in, in Boulder, which is that it needs to be more than just a transit pass. Um, and examples of added value include um, putting a, a, a recreation pass uh, alongside the transit pass. You can do a very similar communi um, community revenue neutral model around um, recreation services as well. Um, offering free bike tune-ups as part of uh, the participating in the pass. Um, this is in partnership with local um, bike shops, etc. Um, having emergency taxi vouchers to give people peace of mind about, uh, you know, what do I do if I don't have my card? Um, and then also uh, pairing with merchants to give discounts to people who are using an EcoPass in the neighborhood. Um, again, uh, just a quick uh, overview of what exactly the transit uh, plan says. Um, there are, um, there's talk about um, things that encourage sustainable transportation behavior, which this all just would. Um, support fair options that encourage transit use by families. I think it's imp really important to uh, to stress um, that the transit system that exists right now doesn't work for families. I had a really good conversation with a, fr a friend of mine about this. Um, and it's really uh, unfortunate that we are making families choose between their children's immediate experience and the act of leaving them a better world for the future with stable climate. Um, I do also want to say one quick thing, which is that uh, transit passes are a demand side intervention. The region is also desperately in need of supply side solutions. We do need to, to be working both. Um, the bus lane that Eric proposed is actually falls under the demand side in terms of, uh, oh, sorry, uh, supply side as well, in terms of better managing the supply that we already have. Next slide. And uh, so the three key actions I was going to say that you can't really tell what that says. It's actually four key act actions. Um, so keep these on, uh, options in mind uh, and on the table while we are talking about mobility pricing because mobility pricing is going to be about solving the supply side. We do have to think about wh uh, how things are gonna look on the demand side in terms of uh, getting people to actually want to ride the transit that we're gonna, we're gonna invest in. Um, consider the cost of the transit service that we actually need, not just what's available now. So if we're, we're going in neighborhood to neighborhood, we want the service that uh, meets the, the demands because right now our buses are so overcrowded that it, it even, even putting up, making a pass based on that price wouldn't make sense. Okay. Um, and then uh, keep the conversation going. That's all I got. Thank you very much.